Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now you can see that we're holding steady here at about 1650 for silver. We're up above that significant volume uh, where the volume came in. That's back here. So that does seem to create support. Now I wanted to show you, I was going through the currencies, looking at the ruble, the yen, the euro, and they're still relatively weakening against the dollar. And that uh, brought me to the dollar index. Now, if we look at the dollar index and we pull it out on a long term here, you can see that the dollar index has come from back in 2008 about 70 to now we're at about 92. So we're talking about maybe a 30% increase in the value of the dollar since that time. Now, if you think about the price of silver at that time frame, then you know we had silver around $9. And uh, now we've got silver around 1650, but we've got about the dollars worth about 30% more. So we need to take maybe 25 or 30% off the price of silver here, and that would put us down around $12 or so. So you can see that right now, with the valuable dollars that we have, and I don't think that's going to last real long, um, silver is just so incredibly cheap. It's such a buy right now. If you look at historically, um, how much it costs. We're, we're really talking about silver being as cheap as it was back in 2006 or so, or at the bottom in 2008. So that's really incredible. Now we're going to look into the issue over Harvey Organ. That's a big controversy. If you remember, Harvey Organ went on Greg Hunter's program and made the call that he thought that uh, silver was going to hit $200. And the basis of his prediction was that um, they were going to run out. He was looking at the Shanghai Exchange. He was looking at the comics. He was looking at the inventories. He was looking at how many he thought would stand for delivery for the month. And based on that, he was projecting that they, they would have a default and that silver would go to $200. Obviously, he was wrong. And uh, I've made some wrong calls myself. His reasoning seemed sound. Uh, where they came up with the silver, I have noticed that... Um, if you look at the Shanghai silver stocks, that it's kind of flatline near zero or 2%, around 2 So I don't know where they're coming up with that silver, but they seem to have managed to come up with enough silver to keep the game going. So I want to look at this Harvey Organ controversy. Now, we're going to start out with this video here. This is kind of a useless video. This is Don Harold, and uh, I don't even want to go into that character. I've had my run-ins with him. And uh, But I wanted you to look at some of the other characters that pop on here because this is what's really interesting to me is that uh, when you look at the, the people that are involved, now, of course, the first one we have here is Josh Galt. And I believe that that's the Josh. He used another name, but this is the guy, if you remember, this is the guy that uh, created a big controversy because he accused me of having my followers break into his apartment and steal the silver and then take his YouTube channel down. It's like really crazy stuff. Then we have, you know, of course there's Don Harold, and I don't even need to tell you about him. Then we've got Moments in Trading. This guy is another peach. This is one that uh, these people seem to dedicate their lives to bashing silver, bashing silver stackers, bashing the silver uh, gurus, let's say, and uh, and they just that's what they love to do and then of course we've got Cosmogato on here and the, this guy would been a thorn in my side for a long time so you notice they all pile on here let's look at what Josh Galt says here he says here's the thing Don Harvey Organ has been convicted of fraud half a dozen times over the past two decades he stole millions in medical aid headed to Bosnia during the war and sold it for profit in Canada how many people suffered or died because of this he has been convicted of replacing brand name pharma drugs with generic brands in prescriptions, again leading to allergic reactions and medical emergencies in patients. He's been convicted of smuggling non-FDA approved pharma across the border. He's been convicted of replacing HIV antiretrovirals with placebos, quickening death in many. One of his business partners in the 80s mysteriously turned up dead. He's no angel. He purposely deceives others for profit. He has never spent a day on Bay Street, Wall Street, or Howe Street. He is scum, and his only precious metals exposure is with his jewelry buddies in Hamilton, many of whom are mob. 
wow. Now that is really incredible. And I owe a lot of this information, uh, the research, Jennifer did the research for this, but that is absolutely shocking. Now, if this, if this stuff doesn't pan out to be true, this, this person I would think would be uh, subject to a lawsuit at least defamation of character and libel. I mean, this, these are some serious allegations that this person is making against Harvey Organ. So Jennifer did a lot of digging into this. Now, a lot of this isn't available. He puts a link down there, and we'll look at the link. But a lot of this stuff that he's saying, we couldn't find anything on it. Now, the first thing that we found is uh, this article talking about the rebates issue. And we'll read a little bit of this. A Hamilton pharmacy owner with a long history of battling Ontario and American drug re regulators is among those facing charges following a major crackdown by Ontario's health ministry on improper reselling of generic drugs. Kohler's is also facing four similar charges and the pharmacy has been ordered to repay the ministry $4.4 million in excessive rebates. For an individual, each conviction carries a maximum fine of $25,000 for a first offense and up to one year in jail. For a corporation, each conviction carries a maximum fine of $50,000 for a first degree offense for the company, etc., etc. So basically, the essence of these charges are that they were selling the generics, they were getting rebates, because what had happened is the government of Canada had established the, the amount of money that they would reimburse for generics. And of course, the market being what it is, the generic drug companies were trying to incentivize the pharmacists to uh, sell theirs instead. So, and you have to remember, keep in mind when we're reading through all this stuff that you have this specter of big pharma and big government uh, always you know behind the scenes here pulling the strings because big pharma this is big big money this is billions and billions of dollars so this is one of the allegations this is really one of the only ones we could find except for this one this is another article talking about Harvey Organ and this is from uh, the CBC in uh, 1998, two former executives of a pharmaceutical company have pleaded guilty in Toronto to profiting from the resale of medicine that was donated for humanitarian causes. Harvey Organ of Toronto and Moshe Green of Hamilton were each fined $300,000 yesterday. Another man charged in the scheme is said to have stolen the medicine, which was destined for the Caribbean and Bosnia and sold it to Oregon and Green, who resold it in Canada, police said. The lawyer for the two former executives said his clients deny any knowledge of fraud, but ple pleaded guilty to avoid lengthy trials. So how do you know if the drugs, if you're buying, if you're reselling drugs in your pharmacist, how do you know that they're stolen? That seems a little bit strange. So compare those news articles to the allegations. He stole millions in medical aid headed to Bosnia during the war and sold it for profit in Canada. Really? So that that is uh, really a serious allegation. Now let's look at, at some of the things that Harvey said in his own defense. This is from uh, director of Hamilton. Hamilton Pharmacy denies participating in an illegal rebate scheme. A Hamilton Pharmacy owner said the Ontario government acted swiftly and without adequate information when it alleged his business was part of an illegal rebate scheme that involved the reselling of generic drugs. In April, seven generic drug companies, four wholesalers, and one pharmacy were fined $33.8 million by the province for paying or receiving more rebates than permitted. Health Ministry officials said audits revealed major discrepancies between what the generic drug companies reported having paid and the amount pharmacies reported receiving in what are known as professional allowances. According to the province, forensic audits found some pharmacies were purchasing a greater amount of drugs than they required, collecting rebates on the full amount, then returning what they didn't need to the wholesaler. The government said the wholesaler then resold the drugs, triggering a second professional allowance payment. The scheme enabled professional allowances to be collected several times, officials said. Over a one-year period, generic drug companies reported paying pharmacies more than $680 million in professional allowances, while pharmacies told the province they received $320 million, 
according to the ministry. So basically there's a discrepancy between what the generic drug companies say they paid and what the pharmacists said they received. So kind of not really that big of a scandal I'd have to say. Now here's another uh, article talking about the same issue and this is from Auto Community News. A Hamilton pharmacy owner says Ontario's health ministry never bothered to audit his business before laying a host of charges and slapping his pharmacy with a $4.4 million penalty during a highly publicized blitz against an alleged drug recycling scheme. Had the health ministry simply done an audit, owner Harvey Oregon claims, it would have shown that Kohler's drugstore on James Street North sells the vast majority of its drugs to customers outside Ontario through a Health Canada wholesaler's license. Kohler's is not involved in drug recycling or any other illegal improper scheme. Oregon stakes in a lengthy court affidavit and should not have been caught up in Ontario's ministry's efforts to stomp out such alleged activities. And it goes on. So in the course of digging through all of this stuff, and you have to remember, as I said before, you've got big pharma and you've got big government. So let's let's take a look at the players, the big government players here. Um, this is going to be the the kingpin of the big government players here. This is Helen Stevenson, and Helen Stevenson is the bureaucrat who is behind the crackdown that uh, Harvey Organ was caught up in. Now this article is really shocking because this is almost something out of like a Homeland Security propaganda piece. I've really never seen so much uh, just um, kind of fear-mongering type of stuff. Let's read through this. Drug reforms have Ontario, Ontario bureaucrat on high alert. Helen Stevenson, the provincial bureaucrat spearheading controversial drug reforms, has received death threats and angry mail from pharmacists. She has a panic button on her desk. Police do drive-bys past her house to make sure she's safe. Her office has been relocated to a more secure setting. Welcome to the dangerous life of Helen Stevenson, the bureaucrat spearheading Ontario's controversial drug reforms. The Assistant Deputy Minister of Health has been the target of death threats and thousands of angry letters, emails, and phone calls. While she admits the intimidation tactics have unnerved her, she says they are failing to move the province off course in implementing the biggest changes to its drug program in decades. Quote, you have to believe in what you do, and I absolutely believe the government has made the right decisions, she says. The latest reforms are aimed at slashing the price of generic drugs by banning millions in payouts from drug companies to pharmacies. Pharmacists argue this will drive smaller drug stores out of business and force others to cut back on hours and services. Threats against Stevenson date back to 2006 when the Liberal government made its first attempt to control drug costs with new legislation requiring pharmacies to pass on volume purchase discounts on generic drugs covered by the Provincial Benefit Program. Quote, if someone on the phone tell me if he had a gun, he was going to come and kill me, she recounts. Also that year, an individual at an industry meeting threatened to chop her head off. In both cases, the threats were made by pharmacists, Stephen says. Stevenson says. Charges were never laid. The 46-year-old single mother of three school-aged children says some strange things have happened around her Toronto home. She's purposely vague on details, but says at one point someone tried to break in and she has found unusual things in her mailbox. I won't speak specifically, but in the middle of the night, there were weird things happening and neighbors noticing strange things. I think a little bit of this is probably harassment, Stevenson says. Freedom of information requests have been made to the Ministry for personal information about her and an ally in the pharmacy industry has warned her that a private detective is tailing her, she says. Stevenson says that since 2008 she's received as many as 400 postcards with a picture of a tombstone on them from members of the Independent Pharmacists of Ontario. And by the way, Jennifer researched that. She found out that uh, the tombstone represents the death of their industry. It wasn't a threat at all. It's a, it's what they have on all of them. 
quote, I get a huge amount of hostility and almost hatred from some pharmacists, but it's by no means all pharmacists, Stevenson says. Representatives of industry associations say they know nothing of the threats and emphasize that they would never condone such action. Certainly, we've had our issues with Helen, but under no circumstances would we ever, ever direct a pharmacist to take this type of action and whoever this individual was. And I don't think it's ever been proven that it's a pharmacist, probably has some sort of psychiatric disorder, says Dean Miller, chair of the Ontario Pharmacists Association. Still, he acknowledges that the reforms have caused emotions to run high, especially among the independent pharmacists whose livelihoods are at stake. Miller notes that the serious threats against Stevenson date back four years it's an old issue, but quite truthfully, Helen tends to li- likes to tend to keep breaking it up. She's not that fond of our industry. I think you can probably tell that. And it goes on. So uh, just a really shocking article with this bureaucrat who is uh, painting herself as a victim, almost like a victim of terroristic pharmacists. So... This really uh, piqued my interest. Who is this woman and what is going on here in Canada? Well, here's an article on it uh, about her. One million dollars in untendered contracts tied to top health official. Untendered contracts totaling one million dollars were awarded by the province to a consulting firm whose top executive was later appointed as one of the government's top health bureaucrats, the Canadian press has learned. Helen Stevenson, the Assistant Deputy Minister and Executive Officer of Ontario's Public Drug Programs, was hired as a consultant in 2005 by the Health Ministry when she was president of Savatuck Inc., a government spokesman confirmed late Tuesday. Between June 2005 and June 2007, the government gave Savatuck three sole source contracts totaling just over $1 million, according to provincial public accounts. Stevenson was hired in her capacity as a consultant to head up the province's drug system secretariat, whose purpose was to de- develop and implement new strategies to manage the province's drug costs, said Health Ministry spokesman David Jensen. So this goes on, and uh, there's a lot of other questions about Helen Stevenson and the money that she's collected. So I wanted to do a little bit of research into her. And one of the things I found is her LinkedIn. You can see she's currently president and CEO of Reformulary Group. Obviously, that's some type of health thing. You can see Reformulary Group, Helen Stevenson, is using her expertise to lower the rise of private sector prescription drug costs and reduce the negative effects those costs have on employees. So here she is. She's in the same business that was apparently very profitable for her before. Now, so you can see President and CEO of Reformulary Group from 2011. She was the Assistant Deputy Minister of Health and Executive Officer from 2007-2010. She was the Executive Lead of the Drug System Secretariat from 2005 to 2007. And for 10 years, she was the President of Savatuck. So this piqued my curiosity a little bit. What is this Savatuck? Well, if we go and we look on the Wayback Machine, we find, because if you go to savatuck.com right now, and you can also do research, we'll see when we get to the Google search, that uh, Savatuck, which was international and Savatuck Incorporated, um, was uh, uh, went bankrupt and was reorganized or just went out of existence. So this is the uh, archive, web archive, and you can see that the year here, is 2005. So we really only have a presence here. You see you have six captures from June 4th from 04, I'm sorry, from the 5th of June in 04 to the 28th of January in 05. This is what all the captures have. There's a little link here. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, The website doesn't exist. So as far as I can tell, this is just a fake front website. It really doesn't 
have anything, never really did have anything. Now, here is a who is lookup on the domain. You can see it was registered at twocows.com. It was registered in February, February 18th of 2000. It expires February 18th of 2018, but there's nothing on the site right now. Uh, you can see here when we look at the contact information, the registrant organization is Savatuck Inc. And the registrant email is Helen Stevenson at reformulary.com. So this is clearly the same person. Uh, she's the owner of that domain, this domain that seems to be kind of like just the front to me. And so I was curious to try to see, well, this Savatuck.com, what did they do? Who were they? Uh, what business were they involved in? What consulting did they do? Well, if you go, I'll put all these links on the video. If you go through a Google search here and look through, you really only find either articles about her compensation, controversial compensation. Here, top health bureaucrat benefited $1 million. Um, there's those articles. Then there's, uh, then there's just some general DNS stuff. But I've gone through all of these links and there's absolutely no information whatsoever about Savatuck, what they did, what was on their website. We know from the archive there wasn't anything on their website. So it's very interesting because I have found researching these sorts of things that when you're dealing with people who make these incredible accusations such as the accusations that we have here. Now, this Don Harold one is actually kind of, I don't even know what he's saying. Don's kind of crazy. He's saying something about it's its not Harvey's problem. It's your problem for listening to him. But but when you have these people like Josh Galt and, and these crazy people like this Helen, that they actually, what I found is that these people actually do the things that they accuse you of. In other words, when they come out and accuse you of being a crook or a, or a scammer or a, you know, a stalker or something like that, it's actually that's what they are. And that's fascinating because I've found that to be uh, the case in my personal experience and then digging into this Harvey Organ thing, that seems to be the case there. So I can't really find any dirt on Harvey Organ. Uh, I seems to me that Harvey made a bad call. I don't think you can make a price prediction based on when you think the comic's going to go bust. Do I think that silver's going to hit $200? Absolutely. I think it's going to hit $200 and beyond. But uh, we don't know, and we're not going to predict. And we'll talk to you next time.